Hello and welcome to the Ukrainian Toronto Television Podcast. Our today's guest is Oz Katerji, a British freelance conflict journalist who previously worked with NBC, Sky News and many more, who's covered Russian war crimes in Syria for many years and now he's in Ukraine. The UK was not the country that popped up in the news too often in Ukraine, uh, apart from like some Ukrainian oligarchs suing each other or buying real estate in London. But since the start of the war, um, it has changed uh, and it was the UK which was um, in the leadership position in terms of military assistance, in terms of breaching the Russian red lines and all sorts of taboos. So it was surprising for us, uh, for Ukrainians, because we didn't have that that tight relationship with great with, with the United Kingdom, but um, since then it changed dramatically. Why did it happen? Why why the UK w- became this kind of a leader? Why the UK um, had this strong position against Russia and for Ukraine? So, uh, a, f- a few things there to unpack. Uh, first, I should say that I think that your description of events kind of underplays the united states role and uh, yeah. that britain britain was able britain was able to be so bold because it had a bold you know ally across the pond that was uh you know also wanting to defend and support ukraine and one wonders um how that dynamic might have been different if there'd been another president in the in the white house uh but and also it's key to to remind people that while Britain has sort of, you know, broken lines and, and, and sent more advanced weapons, um, the American contribution dwarfs that of, of, of Britain's, um, obviously, the, the, the size of their economies and the size of our, our, our respective military uh, forces, is, you know, explains that. But um, I think it's key that... that while Britain's role is significant and important and has been impactful, uh, that that's taken within the context of of uh, the coalition of partners that Ukraine has, and it, it really is a coalition of of partners. Now, with regards to Britain's role, I suppose the comparison you're going to make is com- with France and Germany uh, as the other powers in 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 Europe. Um, compared to France and Germany, Britain seemed, you know, quite robust in its defense of Ukraine, whereas Germany and, and France uh, tried to be, you know, tried much more diplomatic avenues. It seemed, you know, even while all hope was lost, Macron and Schultz were still, you know, hoping that... that Colin uh, Putin... A deal. Yeah. You, you, you know, um, now, now Putin does that he was trying to uh get as much out of uh, get as many concessions as possible and still invade in the in the process humiliating uh, european leaders and embarrassing them that was his power play um i i you know th- when it comes to boris johnson uh you know th- <laughs> there are many things that can be said and i'm famously not a not a supporter of his but uh, it's also un- undeniable and unquestionable that he is a hero to the Ukrainian people, that he uh, broke taboos on weapons, that he you know, was the first politician to, to come to Kyiv um, after the war had, had been launched. These were, were seen as not just symbolic uh, you know, acts of solidarity with the Ukraine, but material acts of solidarity with the Ukrainian people. And... You know, driving around Kiev in the early days and speaking to the volunteers and seeing the British weapons in their hands, you know, they were very much like, God save the Queen, thank you, Boris Johnson, you know, we like having things that we can feel with our hands. You know, these are... Uh, before we go next, one thing, we here at Ukraine and Toronto Television are trying our best fighting Russian propaganda and misinformation. We are inviting the best of the best experts and journalists such as us and we would actually love to this podcast to be heard and seen by as many people as possible and you could actually help with that by liking this video and subscribing to our channel and to, by leaving the comment below and probably even donating to our buy me a coffee and um, yeah that's pretty much it thank you
how did it combine? Like, I know that um, people in, in in the UK don't like them that much now. Uh, like, how how this like the, the, he is like kind of erratic person. How did how does it combine in him? Like being a hero on here on on this scene, and the same person being the absolute antagonist. And yeah, and as yeah, but as far as I'm concerned, even though some people in the UK dislike him very much, they fully supported his efforts in Ukraine. So how does that how does that work? So so that hasn't changed. Uh, and but Ukraine is one of the few things that Boris Johnson has in his did a good job in or relatively good job in pile. Um, you know, it, it, he he also seemed at home with dealing with the situation in Ukraine, whereas he kind of, you know, the things that undermined Boris Johnson's reign as prime minister were like incompetence, arrogance, you know, on on domestic political issues that require competence and you know <laughs> level headedness and. And and that's just not Boris Johnson. He's a populist. He 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 kind of has this persona of this bumbling oaf, but really he's quite you know pulling strings and whatever. But you know all of his political machinations are about are, are really self serving, um, and he's a very selfish man and and a, and a, you know a, a liar. Just a just a liar. Can't stop lying. And he's had a history of being fired from newspapers for lying. You know this was all already known. Well, you he won't tell you how many children he has. You know, this is not a <laughs> this is not a nice man. Um, so that's the those are the reasons why the British people got got sick of him. Uh, but you know, as I said, he he felt at home with the political uh, uh, the political platform of Ukraine in, in in British politics made him feel I don't know like a statesman. I suppose <laughs> I don't, I don't want to. Look, I, I, I've never met the man, and I've never sat down with him and and and, and, and asked him any questions to be able to to get a personal insight into his brain. Uh, I can just comment on you know the, the many reports I've seen over many years of my life um, that I can't tell you why personally Ukraine mattered. I I don't want to impart a kind of morality or whatever on it. I, I can talk more broadly about the, the British government's response. And yes, you are quite correct that, that, that Britain above and beyond. But that was that's a popular position across the entire Conservative Party and across, you know, the opposition in Labour and the SNP and the Liberal Democrats. Like support for Ukraine is a completely cross-party political situation. And, and when the Tories are out of power and Labour are in power, that that level of support will be absolutely maintained uh, so there's no there's no reason to worry about that but i suppose i suppose your your audience are interested in kind of that moment and and why boris johnson rose to to the prominence and i don't want to i don't want to compare him to churchill in fact i re i refuse to do that because that's something he's very obsessed with but but the oh. one thing that I, i i will say yeah boris johnson is obsessed with churchill obsessed with being churchill Uh, he thinks everything is his own private <laughs> World War II, and and you know, yeah, now that now that's the answer actually yeah, makes makes a lot of sense. Here's the thing about Churchill: is up until World War II, Churchill was you know a flip flopper, someone who got things wrong, catastrophically wrong. Uh, you know, he was seen as quite a eccentric, shall we say, as a polite way of of putting it. He wasn't well trusted, uh, Churchill, but he got. World War II, he got Hitler absolutely correct. Um, and uh, uh, to be honest, Boris Johnson's been really, really, really soft on Putin throughout his throughout his years. Soft That's on true. Putin, oligarchs. You know, there's been no, there's you know, there are definitely voices in the Conservative Party, uh, MPs that that have always, always, always seen Putin for who he is always or you know ha have been the like churchillian figure in the back benches shouting this is a monster you know uh those people exist in the conservative party boris johnson was never one of them so i don't want i don't want people to think that he was <laughs> any way like churchill in his understanding of of uh vladimir putin however i will say one thing that will probably a lot of ukrainian your, your ukrainian audience will understand is While Volodymyr Zelensky was incredibly popular and swept to power before the war, 
his opinion levels were really poor. He he also seemed to think that there was some way of averting all of this. He seemed to be slow to to react initially to mobilize. Um, that all changed overnight, and Zelensky be- grew into the role. Uh, it, it was crazy how it happened. I mean, I was shocked by it personally. Uh, and oh, I spoke, we were too. Oh, all, all of us, no, yeah. Don't worry about it. We were as well. <laughs> no, I, I was I was very much a Zelensky skeptic um, when I came here, and, and I was blown away by, you know, the man, you know, I could compare it to maybe Emmanuel Macron, who I thought uh, when he was on the campaign trail, I thought this this guy's speaking in some quite muscular terms about liberalism, you know, confronting Russia. Russia's trying to get Le Pen in. And he's like, yeah, as soon as he became president, he, you know, fell back into himself and became just absolutely enamored by trying to revive this French-Russian partnership that I, I don't know. I don't know what's in his head when he thinks that way. Um, you know, like when Ukraine, we have this kind of concept now that the, there are presidents for peace times and there are presidents for war. And I mean, Zelensky was blamed for incompetence for the longest time, and he was incompetent in a way, and he was in a way very arrogant and all of these things. So I just assume we have found this new kind of if you will, phenomenon of these politicians who are meant to, to, you know, lead in times of crisis and military crisis and presidents who, and, and the same people who are not that, uh, I guess, fit on domestic front when we talk about peaceful times. Would you say that about Boris Johnson? So look, I, I, again, I have to contextualize it. In, in context, Boris Johnson's actions towards Ukraine were popular in parliament. They were popular with the country. There was no difficulty for boris johnson to send a bunch of weapons to ukraine there was no political difficulty that he had to overcome to do that uh so i i i i wouldn't want boris johnson to be leading this country or britain (laughs) rather i'm in i'm in ukraine right now i wouldn't want boris johnson to be leading britain into a war i just wouldn't he's too incompetent for that so no i don't think Boris Johnson is the man for... I mean, as you've seen, Rishi Sunak has just completely taken over that role and done the same. Now, again, he hasn't been as symbolic a figure as the Ukrainian see Boris Johnson uh, because he did make some big first steps and he deserves immense credit for that. I don't want to, I don't want to take away any credit that, that he deserves for that. I just don't want to... I don't want to give him credit that he doesn't deserve and 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 say that these things were difficult or that maybe he was the right man for that moment in crisis because really I think pretty much any leader of the conservative party over you know from David Cameron through to Rishi Sunak would have had the uh, virtually similar response maybe not be as kind of you know Boris Johnson played up to that image as well we have to bear that in mind it wasn't just the People were throwing it on him. He very much, you know, embraces that um, man for the moment kind of thing. But uh, yeah, look, well, Britain's re- Britain's standing in with Ukraine isn't about Boris Johnson. He has played a really important symbolic and material role. But Britain's relationship with Ukraine and our support for Ukrainian sovereignty and statehood and um, security, uh, and these are. Um, these are they go much deeper than any any one political party or any one politician and although it's a shame that it's taken this invasion for that partnership to to be realized um the fact is that that we recognize ukraine as a as a democracy a fledgling democracy at that one that's struggling um you know uh, the poorest country in europe you know blighted by corruption um, you know, these are things that are not unique to Ukraine and shouldn't prohibit um, Ukraine from joining the, the European uh, nations uh, as an ally, as a partner uh, going forward in perpetuity. Uh, yeah, um, regarding the British support, like uh, when I watched uh, during the Eurovision, there was a moment when um, the whole square was singing uh, uh, you will never work alone and uh the the ukrainian flags were on the tv and people were like and it made it, it literally made me cry uh but yeah and you, you mentioned the opposition uh, and 
recently, and I know Jeremy Corbyn, and I know he's not uh, a leader of the, of the Labourist anymore, uh, but uh, like Jer Jeremy Corbyn is a weird figure, and you recently spotted him having a photo with the uh, Norwegian nat Nazi, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and uh, he said some weird things about Ukraine. Is there some weird... Um, weird positions on Ukraine from the left. Uh... So look, on that, yes, I, I did uh, I did post that photo that had been posted by a Norwegian neo-Nazi, but it was clear that Jeremy Corbyn didn't know who he was when he was approached for the photograph. No. Uh, the, the, bigger, the bigger, much more concerning thing is why is this fringe figure from the lunatic Norwegian far right big into Jeremy Corbyn and it's because of Jeremy Corbyn's position on NATO and Ukraine and Julian Assange and all of these other things that the far right and the far left basically agree on and one of you know Jeremy Corbyn's position is that Britain shouldn't be in NATO NATO should disband Britain shouldn't be arming Ukraine Ukraine shouldn't join NATO and that there should be some kind of peace deal made with with Ukraine and and Russia and when Uh, Russia invaded Crimea. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn's response was, "This is NATO's fault." You know, no, no blame on on, on Russia's uh, like intentions towards Ukraine. No matter what the intentions have been, no matter what the actions have been, it's always been okay, fair enough. But let's have a peace talk now. You know, it doesn't matter where that line goes. It'll be till there's nothing left of Ukraine, and he'll still be saying. Yeah, let, let's let's just sit down and and, and talk peace. Let's cut out all the fighting. It, it's it's a fantasy world of politics that he lives in. He's not a very bright man. I don't think he's ideologically evil and and obsessed with uh, Vladimir Putin winning. He's just a stupid idiot. That's the honest truth about. Does Jeremy he have Corbyn. like influence on um on the on the Labourist Party? No, not anymore. I mean, he had emit, he had enormous influence when he was in the campaign to be leader and when he became leader. But after losing two elections, after the anti-Semitism scandal, after the Salisbury poisonings where he showed the nation how he really felt about Russia during that, you know, uh, chem did, a chemical weapon was used on, on the streets of Britain. I, I and, didn't know and, that that he had some weird position on that. So, so yeah, so so he was really, really skeptical and hesitant to pin the blame on Russia when it was very clear that Russia had had done this. And he his response in Parliament when uh, Theresa May, who was Prime Minister at the time, was ex was briefing about Russian involvement, he was asking if she was willing to send the sample of the nerve agent to Moscow so that Vladimir Putin could tell us one way or the other if it was his or not. Um, it just, yes, I, it, he, when he said it, his own backbenchers were like outraged and the Speaker of the House had to had to ask both sides of the House, his own backbenchers to stop yelling at him. Oh. I mean, it was really it was really one of those moments in British politics that uh, really separates um, serious people from fundamentally unserious people and absolutely everyone who defended Jeremy Corbyn and his response to the Skripal uh, poisonings and now his response to the war in Ukraine is a fundamentally unserious person in, in, in the realms of foreign policy. They just, they just are not grounded in reality. They live in a world in which Putin is a man that can, you can make business with, you can sign a deal with and he'll respect that deal because you all, you all agree that you want peace. You probably this is have just to, not the reality. You you know, probably we, have we, to, this isn't the reality. But but Jeremy Corbyn wants to tell you time and time again that the reality is Putin wants peace and he can we can find a way of finding peace. Ukraine just needs to give up enough stuff for Ukraine uh, for Putin to stop being violent towards it, and then there'll be some kind of peace. No justice there whatsoever. There's no talk of justice. He doesn't care about justice. Not in not in Ukraine. Certainly It's not in interesting because you call these people fundamentally kind of not serious, and I agree. But we're in Ukraine, kind of. We have our own habit of looking into things, and um, there's always this tingling sensa sensation of whether it's just stupidity or uh, corruption. 
do you yeah. think it's just plainly stupidity or do you think there are some you know so, proper russian so, assets in, in british politics so there are russian assets in british politics there are people openly working for the russian state like george galloway one of jeremy corbyn's longest friends uh you know uh there are people from excessive old wealth uh who have an ideological uh you know affinity for the soviet union and see putin as a anti-imperialist you know hero in the crusade against western neoliberal hegemony uh these people seamus milne andrew money uh, andrew murray are, are you know very very wealthy old british stalinists you know um and and they were jeremy corbyn's closest advisors uh during his leadership of the labor party um i, I don't think they're russian assets i know seamus milne uh has a relationship with vladimir putin he interviewed him at the valdai club um so so yeah a man who sat down with putin at the valdai club became our the, the spokesperson for the labor party during the jeremy corbyn years um it was really quite quite worrying Seamus Milne is an also a uh, very wild uh, figure in British journalism. Before that, as, a, as the comment editor for The Guardian, he uh, once famously gave Osama bin Laden an op-ed in the newspaper like like any normal. He just went, took one of his speeches and, and published it like, a, you know, no no analysis, just like a first person. Here's Osama bin Laden on, on the filthy Western scum. You know, it, 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 the comedy is... Um, a fringe, fringe, but someone, someone who should never have reached a position of power or influence in the Labour Party, but was allowed to do so because of real, real stupidity, uh, cheerleading by people who don't know anything better, uh, and and a lot of real desperation in in, in Britain, the way the economy's turned out people wanting a progressive change and seeing Jeremy Corbyn as a figure of that uh, and and his his history as you know with the Labour Party and its relationship with Tony Blair invading Iraq the, you know foreign policy was seen as one of his strong points and anyone who actually knew his foreign policy was freaking out about the idea of him becoming a Labour leader but again a lot of very stupid or naive people uh, in British politics decided it was a good idea and decided that they were going to throw their weight behind him and look how it turned out. So, I mean, look, again, this is all into the weeds and I don't know how much it interests the Ukrainian audience. I will just say that if Jeremy Corbyn... Uh, yeah, sorry, I was I was going through a list of, of, of people that are Russian involvement, like yeah, George Corbyn, yeah, yeah. the, the stupid old money Stalinists who have an affinity with the Soviet Union and stupid idiots like Jeremy Corbyn who also has an affinity with the Soviet Union, but is just really not a, not a clever man at all in any... Sh just the guy hasn't... He relies on these other people to give him the politics that he should have on these issues. Um, so, yeah, I, I broadly think that uh, a lot of stupidity got us to that position. And in the context of Ukraine, a Jeremy Corbyn prime minister would have been a disaster... Uh, this, the, the complete opposite of what Boris Johnson was for Ukraine as a symbolic figure of, hey, here's all the weapons and, and support, diplomatic and humanitarian that you need. You've got it. I'm your guy. I'm Boris Johnson. <laughs> that's that's kind of the way he was. Jeremy Corbyn would have would have been still on Provide, the, the end. Provided weapons to Russia. <laughs> you know, no, no, no. He wouldn't have done that. You know, you know that long table that Macron sat at? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 So, so Jeremy Corbyn would have been like, no matter how far Russia was going into Ukraine, he'd just be on an increasingly distant table that's that's constantly going there every week, going out to Moscow, finding incremental, you know, uh, peace. Or in probably our times. under the table. That's the <laughs> option too. He 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 absolutely believes this is NATO's fault and that Russia's been provoked, uh, and and he absolutely would have found ways to blame NATO and agree with Putin on many. We of have the this second second Orban. You know, but but again, or, yes, but, you know, at least Orban is kind of like hamstrung by the EU around him that's sort of, you know, slowly yeah, jabbing yeah, yeah. his, he, you know, Orban is a, is a fascist pro-Putin apologist. There's no, there's no dismissing that. But 
he is constrained by now would jeremy corbyn have been constrained in the same way well we're out of the eu now um and and really he's a man who doesn't listen to anyone he would have gone against his party he would have had immense influence as prime minister to do things like that in the diplomatic foreign policy sphere without having to ask parliament anything you know he would have got his ass handed to him in parliament by labor and the tories if 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 that was a question of should we be arming ukraine or whatnot but as as the the prime minister he he would have exerted great influence in preventing that and i know from talking to soldiers from um the analysis of the of the early days of the war how crucial british weapons were to yes. those those early counter offenses and those early you know those strikes that decapitated those russian columns heading heading into t into populated areas absolutely absolutely so, yes. yeah I, I i think i i do think it's very fair to say that jeremy corbyn would have been a disaster for ukraine in the way that boris johnson wasn't i know that flies in the face of me saying that that, that the British people would have supported Ukraine regardless, but Jeremy Corbyn is like the one, like the anomaly. It like, would be a disaster, ne yeah. Never have happened. He should never have become leader, you know. Yeah. So, so yeah, but, but touching on that and speaking of stupid idiots, uh, currently in the United States, we're seeing that, you know, I mean, it's, it's obviously a Russia's doing as well, but... We are seeing this multi-million uh, anti-Ukrainian, pro-Russian lobby, Elon Musk, Tucker, Trump, uh, just crazy Republicans, far Mainly left, media, far yes. Right. Mainly media, obviously. But, it, I mean, they're getting a kind of, they got a fresh breath of air or something. It's been ridiculous, especially in the last couple of months. And you've said that overall, uh, the, the British public is very supportive of Ukraine and we're no. But... Are there any indications that processes like that actually could happen in Britain? Is, is Russia investing in these kind of movements in politics and in the you know, public sector? Oh, very. Russia's always been uh, trying to influence these debates. And, and the biggest, you know, the loudest voices in, in Britain are those on the hardest of the right and those on the, the hardest of the left. You know, you've got also, you know, pop, more populist figures who... So you have your Tucker of, Carlson, right? I mean, we we have Nigel Farage. Oh yeah, you know he, he's not he's not quite as far right as Tucker Carlson, but he might as well be. Uh, we have uh, you know Corbyn on the populist left, who is agitating for many of the same on many of the same issues. You know, NATO's the threat, NATO's danger. Uh, you know, we should make peace with Russia. The constant idea that Russia should be able to do what it wants and and get a deal out of it. It's kind of like this, this like Trump-like mentality where everything a deals waiting to happen at the end of every every atrocity. Um, it's insane to me. Uh, the idea of, of of there being justice uh, for for crimes, it just seems to be absence on on the left. It's just all of this kind of vacuous term of peace. But look back to your question. No, I don't think uh, there is much danger of of what's happening in the U.S., which is. Donald Trump leading a, you know, again, it, it's, it's a different situation if you're asking me in 2019 or maybe 2017 is how, how dangerous is is this moment for European security if, if Britain has a, 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 a sympathetic to Putin prime minister. Uh, you know, I, that's not a danger. That's not going to happen in the UK that, uh, you know, it's just it, at the moment it's politically impossible. Uh, I think I think it's a far bigger concern for Ukraine. And again, the far left have no no influence on on politics anymore in the UK. None. They're done. You know, they have a few motions they can bring up in trade unions that get shouted down by their own members. It, again, as as a, as a whole, as these people have no power. The real worry is the far right in America, uh, Trumpists. If they can take back the White House, um, you know. It, it could it could do some real real damage to um to america's you know support for ukraine now in the house and in the senate maybe it might be a different thing because the gop and the democrats aren't that far apart on a lot of this uh you know it's mainly kind of like your really insurgent right-wing trumpists that are doing that but um yeah 
that, that that's it's the actually, bigger threat. It's actually refreshing for us and Mark to have a conversation where, uh, you know, for once uh, it doesn't seem like the world is ending. Because usually whenever we talk to like Germans or Americans, it's always we end up really depressed. So yeah. Oz, it's great to hear some, some at least, you know, reassuring things. Um yeah, another Britain, thing I wanna... Britain, Britain stands with Ukraine, resolutely. You know, you've yeah, got a full ally there. Much. That's not going to go. That, is, you know, that sounds me. so nice. You, you know, it's just, it's, just, it's just just how it is, looking at the data, the polling. It, you know, it's not, it's not a case of thanking individual British people. We just, we see a, a fundamental wrong and we oppose it. And it's just, it's just, that's the level of solidarity it is. It's, Sorry, I have to ask. Yeah. It's a short, 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 short question, uh, and maybe a funny one. Is it like is there some kind of uh, an, like anti-Russian historical sentiment in uh, uh, in British people, in UK, uh, like yeah. uh, Russophobia? Not, so not, not 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 like there is in in parts of the Europe that had you know Russian domination. It's it's never really been a huge. Uh, most people. Russia only began really talked about, uh, in, in, you know, with Putin's kind of more aggressive acts, you know. I uh, guess Litvinenko uh, murdering yeah, of the opposition, the, yeah. The, the, these things, you know, were obviously going to trigger a reaction in Britain. Um, you know, we we have had two major incidents on our streets of chemical and biological uh, and, and, and nuclear uh, radioactive weapons used on british streets by ordered by vladimir putin uh, that pisses pe that pisses, pisses british people off you know so so i don't think it's a historical thing it's a recent kind of you know and it's one man you know i, I don't remember growing up and people hating boris yeltsin or <laughs> just it, it just wasn't a thing right it just uh, people just don't you know britain really doesn't think about the world that much <laughs> we probably think about America a, a lot, but we really don't. I have to I'll be honest. Britain really doesn't give a fuck about anyone or anything. <laughs> really, uh, as a general kind of mentality, British people think that they're the centre of the world. So that's not you know, bad. I mean, I mean, it just is. It's fine. It, yeah, but but look, I, I don't think that's a unique thing to the British people. But yeah, but if 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 Europeans are looking for a uh, to, to say, oh, well, the British have always been, you know, uh, against <laughs> Russia. I really don't, just have never given a shit. You know, it's not like Napoleon, we're just desperate to conquer Russia or whatever. It's just not, it's not an art, yeah, not us. Yeah, well, we're like talking about histor historic kind of perspectives here, and, and that was a very good insight. But I have a question about more recent history, mm -hmm. um, and it's 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 actually a phenomenon that's uh, about Russia that is, I would think, kind of it's not unique to the UK, but it's like a part of the uh, part of the political history now. So you know, for for a long for the longest time. Um, you know, the luxury property market in London and Southeast England and, you know, has been feasting on investment from Russians and uh, other Soviet states as well. But, you know, the UK has always been this place where all these oligarchs would go and, you know, live, purchase all sorts of football clubs, real estate, for instance, uh, Russian oligarch Lebedev, who's the owner of the Evening Standard and the Independent, and I mean, his son is, was a yeah. good friend of UK, I mean, Boris Johnson, and then also, uh, his father Lebedev, he was, uh, and I mean, I say was because he was a KGB agent, but you never know. There are serious allegations that he never stopped working for the, for Russia. And he painted himself as this semi-oppositionist, but yet he, supported the uh occupation of Crimea by Russians and he's just one of one of one of many Russians who have found this kind of haven in in London for instance i mean everybody knows about uh about Abramovich everybody knows about Alisher Usmanov um how how did that how did that happen i mean i mean Lebedev's son got to sit i mean he's actually uh you know he, yeah. he was heavily involved in politics too how how did that happen Corruption, vast, vast, vast amounts of corruption, and and British Britain loves money. Just 
fucking can't get enough of money. It doesn't matter where it comes from. It doesn't matter where it comes from. And, and, and you know, the Tories have been in power for a long time, but not like previous Labour Party were, were, were great on Russian money or anything. Uh, but, you know, this is... It's been a, uh, just a, a filtering house for laundered Russian money for for a long time, and uh, the right of the Conservative Party want this kind of you know, you know, just tax haven on crack. Uh, bring all your money. Let's 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 launder it in you know in the streets. Kind of attitude to to Russian petrodollars. I I don't know. Uh, look. Britain's terrible, but but corruption's everywhere. Is it Gazprom? Gazprom sponsored the Champions League for how many yeah. years? And now they're sponsoring, literally sponsoring militias with Gazprom, you know, Gazprom logos fighting in Ukraine. Um, is it is it changing now since this war started? Is are there any movements towards I mean, fixing a lot this? Of them, oh, at least a lot Russia? of them were sanctioned, like the Repaska, yeah. Usmanov, yeah. Friedman. They were all sanctioned, but they were all sanctioned in 2022. But they're yeah. like and, hundreds uh, of thousands. And, and, and yeah. Lebedev was a pro-Russian occupation of Crimea back in 2014, and he was feeling quite comfortable in in in, in London. And the same goes for. I mean, uh, Peter Pomerantsev wrote a book about about these like Russian cliques in, in the UK and you know they heavily invested in art and they had their own little parties all over the place and yeah. at football as you said but did it not like ring a bell of like maybe there is something sketchy about it why was it so I mean corruption is because no one very, cared that, that's the no point cared, I, have, really? uh, I have to point out no one cared right when, when, when Putin invaded Donbass and annexed Crimea there, there you know there wasn't like huge outrage like there was in this invasion you know there Why? was a, when, when putin was bombing hospitals in aleppo you know he, no one no one fucking cared but why I, I, why, I why do they care know, now and i don't know then? i don't know what to tell you i don't know what to tell you i don't know why this is the outrage above all outrages i I've, I've been sick of this since the early 2010s you know, I, I saw what Putin did to Syria and I've I've just dedicated my life to covering what Russia does to civilians in, in its in its warfare ambitions. Like this is just uh, uh, when when he's done I might I might just pack it all up and go. Like this is all that matters to me now is is you know, I saw what Putin had done and and it made me just angry, just outraged as a human being. And and I'm sorry to say it, that, that people did not feel the same way about that. Germany didn't respond that way, you know. Oh, no, they didn't. France, France didn't respond that way. The idea was just to keep working with Putin. Obama decided that the, the best thing to do in Syria, while Russia was bombing hospitals, was to work with Putin to bomb ISIS together. That was their idea. Russia didn't even bother fighting ISIS. They were just killing the opposition while America dealt with the ISIS problem for the regime. But you see, you know, you it see was... America had the interest in dealing with ISIS. Obviously, Germans and yeah. the French were interested in the Nord Stream 2 project but and that, everything but, and but gas. But that was correct. Like, like, fighting ISIS was the correct call. But allying, a de facto alliance with Putin, the confliction channels... After Crimea, were, yes. Were, were just, they was, were just green lights. Listen, you can use chemical weapons. You can do whatever, whatever you want. You can annex parts of another country. We just will not stop you. We will not. In fact, we will keep inviting you to peace conferences and talks. We will keep signing infrastructure deals with you. We will keep treating you as an equal partner on security and terrorism. And uh, it was it was nauseating. And 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 that finally we finally broke free of that from the invasion. Of Ukraine, well, but it took it, it took it took, why, it took why, the why attempt of genocide. It took the well, attempt why, of genocide why, to fix it. Hang on, yeah. hang on, hang on. It's a why was it different? It was ever allowed to happen in the first place. Had Putin been confronted in Syria and when he tried to t take Crimea the first time, effectively, he we wouldn't be here now, right? We no, would. I completely agree, a hundred percent. Absolutely. That. And the point of uh, point of why is just. I can't. I can't speak to the human beings that have no, been. But, like, but for you, in. how do you think? What changed? I mean, obviously, in 2014, nobody because this was bombed a line, Kiev. Because, because this was a line that people thought was too far. Okay. Right? 
pe- uh, people didn't believe that he would actually do it. So many, and 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 he made them all look like idiots. And and people don't like being made to look like idiots. We, we some actually, people some people love to be made to look like idiots, like John Mearsheimer, Jeremy <laughs> Corbyn, every single you know one of those just idiot people that have accepted Putin's line on everything, hook, line, and sinker. You know, atrocity after atrocity. Every one of those people, they have like a humiliation kink. Every single one of them, <laughs> right? But but most people don't like to be made to look a fool. Uh, and you know, look at look at how Schultz has grown into uh, yeah. the role. Compare and look at even 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 Macron, you know, uh, has has provided a lot of heavy equipment to to Ukraine. So people don't don't like to be made to look like stupid idiots, and and that's that's probably why this is happening. What's happened is an outrage, but there were so many outrages before that could and should have been stopped. And uh, you know, I think I think Britain kind of felt alone in the cold after the uh, Skripal poisonings when the kind of the diplomatic reaction, particularly from Trump administration, was just like, hey, you're kind of on your own. Yeah, they they, they murdered someone with chemical weapons. What are you going to fucking do about it? Yeah, not you know, the not, first time, not the last time, whatever. But, but again, again, you know, Putin just kept crossing lines and crossing lines and crossing lines, thinking no one would stop him, right? Just they all went to his head. You know, thinking that, but eventually, you know, rational state actors had to go this far and no further. And they they did that with this war in Ukraine. And it's good that they've done that, but it doesn't make me any less angry about the, their failures in Syria or their failures in Crimea and Donbass before that. I, I'm not Absolutely. any less angry about that. I don't have a good, decent answer for you other than that these crossed lines that people people said was was too far and it, it helped having a biden presidency it really did without biden i don't know how much of this happens i really don't but not because biden represents you know something unique in america but the opposition a, 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 a trump america and a corbyn britain who would have been putting pressure on macron and schultz in those positions uh, it would you know, be a disaster it, yeah I don't exist. want to think about hypotheticals, but uh, you know these things are, 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 are. You know we are where we are because of bad bad decisions got got to get there, but we are now in a place where good decisions are being made. So you know it's it's like, it's tough. It's tough. We yeah, usually it's try world. to yeah. We usually try to end our show with some uh, good uh good thoughts um looking into the bright future uh so i can s- do that yeah I say something <laughs> optimistic then <laughs> yeah look look britain britain stands with ukraine okay it's just one alliance you have nothing to worry about our bond is unshakable and it will go forward for generations to come and you you talked about the um the moment in eurovision where where they were assuming you you'll never walk alone uh, I think people should look at whenever Kosovo plays England in the football and they see um, Kosovans singing the British national anthem. That that stays. Yeah. Uh, that that's that, that's the kind of friendship that um, it just doesn't it doesn't end. And whatever you know, whatever fake friendship that uh, Ukrainians thought they had with with the state of Russia, Russian Federation. That that's that's the relationship that you actually have for the United Kingdom going forward. Thank you very much. That is true. Thank you very much for for being with us. And-